Who said that? Did I actually hit the wrong button? Um, all right, let's talk about temperature. I did actually hit the wrong button because I logged in with my wrong account, um, but that's okay. That doesn't concern you. When we're talking about temperature, we, if we want to scale to describe temperature, if we want units to be able, that we can put with temperature, um, then really what we're, we're doing is we're basically kind of arbitrarily making up a number. We're going to say this is zero and this is 100. That's what makes something a degree scale. Degree usually is kind of like percentage where you basically set a low end and set a high end and then you divvy it up a certain number of times in, in the middle. So for Celsius, what's zero and what's 100? Anybody know what zero Celsius is? Freezing. Yes, yeah, where water freezes. It's a nice convenient, um, it's a convenient number to use because everybody has to deal with water, right? What's 100 Celsius? Boiling. Does anybody know what zero Fahrenheit is? Zero, zero Fahrenheit? Does anybody know it was it was originally set based on a measured number, an empirical number? Does anybody know what they used to do that? Lord, I believe it was Lord Fahrenheit. Um, just basically said, oh, if I I can get colder than freezing water if I add a bunch of salt to the water. So he just used a mixture of salt and ice and water to get as cold as he could get, um, and that turned out that the coldest you could get a mixture of salt and water was about zero Fahrenheit. 100 Fahrenheit is more interesting. 100 Fahrenheit, or at least this is the, the, the um, folk tale that I've heard about it. Um, 100 Fahrenheit is the body temperature of a cow. Um, because, I don't know, because Lord Fahrenheit cared more about cattle than he cared about people. Um, or maybe that's not actually an accurate story, but I've been told that that's what was originally used is the body temperature of a cow um, as the as the 100 mark in Fahrenheit. Um, these conversions are a little bit trickier than regular unit conversions. Right? Does anybody know what the equation is to, com to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit? It's okay. Yeah, I don't expect you to. You have an equation sheet. Close. Uh, it's, on, it's on the slide. I always do that. Uh, yeah, temperature in Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 times temperature in Celsius plus 32. These numbers are exact, meaning they have infinite sig figs. What does it mean when you have something as infinite sig figs? Goes out to infinity. What what goes out to infinity? Zero, 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 zero. Out to infinity. Basically, it has, has as many sig figs as you need it to. So that so that these numbers are never gonna limit how many decimal places you get to keep. Right? The only thing that's gonna limit how many decimal places you get to keep is how is the temperature that you start with. All right, so if we look at kinetic energy, we'll do some, some examples of this in a minute, but I want to talk about Kelvin real quick. If we look at kinetic energy of molecules versus the temperature in, let's call it Celsius, do things still have kinetic energy when when you get to zero Celsius? No. I heard a yes and a no. Can you still have something be a liquid or a gas at zero Celsius? Yeah. yeah. Which means there's still some kinetic energy in there, right? Because think about those phase changes. If something's a liquid, it still has some movement happening, right? If something still has a, if there's a gas, there's still some molecular mo movement happening. So, if we tried to plot a graph of kinetic energy of the molecules versus the temperature, 
it would look like this straight line with a y intercept. What happens? How do we get to zero Kelvin? Or sorry, how do we get to zero kinetic energy? You keep going. So if this is our kinetic energy here, if we follow this back, basically, until we get to a zero, essentially, this last scale, the Kelvin scale, is basically shifting it back so that the, the that be the x-intercept is at the origin. All we do instead, it turns out that that's 273.15 degrees Celsius. You go negative 273 degrees Celsius, that's when you hit zero kinetic energy. And so we basically, there's gonna be a series of calculations that we need to use, uh, we need, the temperature to be proportional to something. Does anybody know in mathematical terms what proportional means? Close. It means it's got a, a it's got a slope, but the slope goes through zero, goes through the origin. So basically, it means you can do a conversion. You can't do a regular conversion here if you're in Celsius because there's this y-intercept. If you take it so that there's no y-intercept, so that the y-intercept and the x-intercept are both zero, that's what makes it proportional. More mathematically, if you double something, this proportional, if you double the temperature in Kelvin, you double the kinetic energy. That's not true if you're in Celsius. If you double the temperature in Celsius, because of this y-intercept, the kinetic energy doesn't necessarily double. Putting it in Kelvin, which basically the conversion between back and forth between Kelvin and Celsius is really easy because the slope is one. It's still got an equation to it. You still can't do it like a conversion factor, but the slope is one. So to go from Kelvin to Celsius, it's just off by that 273 number. Temperature in Kelvin equals temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. That's a measured number. Yeah. And Kelvin is equal to kinetic energy? Proportional to kinetic energy. So when you double your temperature in Kelvin, you'll double the kinetic energy, but they have different units. They're one conversion away is another way of saying that things are proportional. All right, so let's practice doing some conversions with these different temperatures. So here's an example, ethanol boils at 78 Celsius, not at 100 Celsius. What is that in Fahrenheit? What is it in Kelvin? You have a temperature in Celsius and you want to know Kelvin, you plug the temperature in Celsius in right here. I'm just going to add 273. One of the easiest conversions that we do in this class, right? So there's no conversion factors. Just add 273. All right, so for this problem, 78 Celsius plus 273. 0.15, what do we get? Point 0.15 would be the calculator answer, right? How many sig figs are we gonna keep here? What's the rule that we're gonna use? Same number of decimal places. I asked that in a misleading way. I always think about it in terms of sig figs, but really with addition and subtraction, it's keep the same uncertainty, right? Or same number of decimal places as your least certain number. So this one, 78 is plus or minus one degree Celsius. 
which means our answer is going to be plus or minus one degree Kelvin. So the rounded answer here is 351. And we don't write a degree sign for Kelvin. When you write the units for Kelvin, it's just uppercase K. And it took me a long time to work out why that was. But basically, because Kelvin, you're not setting a zero and a 100 and divvy, divvying things up in the in between. Um, you don't put a degree symbol. Yeah. When we get into doing calculations with temperature, pretty much always. Because it's proportional, there's a bunch of equations that don't work if you're not in Kelvin. All right, so the trickiest thing about this conversion is the fact that unlike our regular conversion problems, we're using the addition and subtraction rule for figuring out how many decimals to keep. If this was 78.0, then, then we would keep to the tenths place, right? Going to, in terms of knowing where to round, this equation right here is the trickiest sig fig question I will ask you in this class pretty much. Because it's one equation, one conversion that involves both multiplication and division and addition and subtraction, which means you have to use both rules in the same problem, in the same conversion. So what do we do first? We, I guess we can plug in Celsius. Temperature in Fahrenheit equals 1.8 times 78 plus 32. How do we do this as far as knowing where to round? I know you can all plug that into your calculator and get the answer. That's not the hard part, right? The hard part is knowing where to round. So how do we go about doing that? Did you guys do any problems like this before? Okay. Somebody had an idea over here? No? So basically, anytime you've got a problem where you've got both sets of rules, you have both multiplication or division, and you have addition and subtraction, you have to do your rounding before you switch steps in the order of operations. So you do your multiplication and division first because PEMDAS, right? You follow PEMDAS, but every time you switch from addition subtraction to multiplication division or the other way around, you do your rounding and then you switch rules. So here we've got multiplication. What's the rule for multiplication? Same sig figs, right? So we've got two sig figs here, an infinite sig figs here. How many do we keep when we multiply? Two. 1.8 times times 78 is what? 130 something? 140. And this is, we still haven't done the plus 32 yet. We're not <laughs> going to yet. We want to round this first. So we're going to round it to only two sig figs, right? 140 plus or minus 10. <laughs> because 78 only has two sig figs, after we multiply it, our answer can only have two sig figs. And now we've done our rounding, now we can do the addition and switch to keep the uncertainty the same. So there's a couple of different types of problems that have subtraction and division in them or subtraction and multiplication in them. This is always going to be the way you do it. Every time you switch operations, you do your rounding and switch rules. All right, if you waited to the end to do this, you would have the wrong number of sig figs. We actually lose a decimal place by doing this multiplication. Right, we went from plus or minus one Celsius to plus or minus 10 Fahrenheit because of, just because of the way the math worked out, which seems wrong, but that's the right way to do it. We'd rather be less certain 
or we'd rather have our number look less certain than we are. We'd rather overemphasize the uncertainty than say things are more certain than they are. So what's our final answer here? So 1.7 times 10 to the 2 degrees Fahrenheit or 170 plus or minus 10. For a number like this, this is not really one that we would usually write scientific notation for, right? But if we don't write scientific notation, it's unclear where what's a sig fig. Does this zero count as a sig fig or not? So to make it unambiguous, do you guys use that term? Yeah. A little bit. I saw some head nods, but I also I also heard some nose. Ambiguous just means you can't look at the number and tell where how many sig figs it is. 170 is an is an ambiguous number because that could be two sig figs or it could be three sig figs. We don't know where the uncertainty is. So if you ever write an ambiguous number. You either have to put it in scientific notation, or at the very least, you need to specify plus or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. If you write out the uncertainty like this, that's no longer an ambiguous number, right? Because I'm explicitly saying where the uncertainty is. Or if you write it in scientific notation, it's never an ambiguous number because everything that you write in the coefficient of a scientific notation counts as a sig fig. And so either of these answers, as far as the rounding goes, and again, we're getting bogged down in the details of the rounding. Math was really easy here, right? The conversion itself is pretty easy. I get, tend to get lost in these because a lot of people are used to getting everything perfectly right on their calculations. If you just guessed, if you kept three sig figs instead of two, for the most part, that's like a half a point deduction getting the calculation done and knowing how to use the right or what equation to use is more important than getting the rounding perfect. But if you want to get perfect scores, which again, are pretty rare, um, then you've got to be paying attention to this as much as you can. The way I put, try to put people at ease when it comes to the rounding thing, is if you're doing your best to follow the rounding rules, then it's not going to be the difference between an A and a B for you. If you're doing your best on all these, it, you know, you might get a 92 instead of a 95 on, on the test, but it's very unlikely it's going to be the deciding factor that tips you into a whole grade lower. Make sense? It, I mean, it, obviously it's possible, but I've never had that be the case. Let's do one more that's kind of kind of interesting. Um, what let's go the other direction. Negative 40. Let's go negative 40.0 in Fahrenheit. Into Celsius. What is it? I know that one off the top of my head. This is sort of, a, I didn't mean for this to be a trick question. I asked this on a test once um, and my students, I got a bunch of students that thought that they were doing the math wrong. Like somebody even wrote the equations broken because if it turns out if you plug negative 40 Fahrenheit into this equation and solve for temperature in Celsius, it's also negative 40. This is the point where those two lines actually intersect. So negative 40, you actually don't need to specify Celsius or Fahrenheit because negative 40 in one is also negative 40 in the other. Let's do the math. Negative 40.0 equals 1.8 times temperature in Celsius plus 32. 
Start by subtracting 32. We're trying to solve for this, right? And when we do the subtraction, what's our rule for rounding? Decimal places. So negative 72.0 equals 1.8 temperature in Celsius. It would, but remember that's an exact number, 32. So it's 32.000. It's not about 32, right? It's exactly 32. Which means we're keeping to the tenths place because this number started with the tenths place. It turns out 72 divided by 1.8 is 40. How many sig figs do we keep? It's exactly 40 on your calculator. Let me plug this in, right? And it's not even a guess, really, right? But because we started with the three sig figs, exactly. So we get to keep three sig figs again. So if you see negative 40, it, I'm not, I don't ask that on tests anymore because I really was not trying to throw people off. I was thinking as I was writing tests, oh, this will be something fun for them. They'll think this is cool when they learn this on the test. And I just totally broke some of my students. Um, I didn't mean to do that. So I won't ask that on the test again. And now you've seen it anyway. All right, we feeling okay about this? The rounding's still a pain, but the math is straightforward. Get out of here, football players. All right, last point for the football players on your way out the door. Kelvin will never be negative. This is for everybody, not just the football players, but on your way out the door. If you calculate Kelvin is negative, you did something wrong. All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit now. Do some more concept stuff, similar to what we did last Friday. We talked about matter. And we talked about different substances and, and phase changes. Um, but it turns out we, can, we need some more rules as far as how we're going to classify different types of matter as well. Because it turns out, how do we know if something is the same substance if we don't have a way of classifying this type of substance is water, for instance, and water has these properties, or this type of substance is copper. So we basically design a sort of a flow chart that we use to sort of break up um, all matter at the top of the flow chart. And then we can break it up into a series of different categories. So all matter is matter. Everything is matter. But not everything that's matter is identical. So obviously, there's more than one type of matter. And that's what we're getting into here is um, at its most basic, if it's, if your matter is made up of only one type of atom, then it's what's called an element. And if it's made up of more than one type of element of atom, it's a compound. And so that's a pretty easy distinction to make, at least on paper, because all you have to do is say, well, how many different types of elements are there? If it's only one type of element, it's an element. That doesn't mean that all elements look the same, or even that all, all states of a single element look the same. So like we talked about before, gallium can be a solid, gallium can be a liquid, gallium can be a gas. And there's more than one type of solid. Right, we talked about that a little bit. Anybody remember the examples of, that I used? One of them? 
what's something a really common substance that has more than one type of solid? Water or salt? Ice. Ice has lots of different types, right? I said that there's like 11 different types of ice. They're based on what's the pressure and the temperature change what the crystal structure looks like. The more everyday one is actually carbon. Carbon can be coal, anthracite, or it can be a diamond. They're both solid, they're both elements, but they don't look identical. Like they have different properties. So we need some more ways to differentiate these as well. And right, so one of the key things about a compound though, comp so compounds are made of more than one element but they're always combined in the exact same ratio. Meaning it's not, it's not approximate. What's anybody know the formula for water? H2O, right? Is it about two to one? Is it H approximately two? Oh, no, it's exactly. You have to have two hydrogens for every one oxygen or it's not water. So with that in mind, that's what's meant by always combined in the shape in the same ratio. If you take the same elements and combine them in a different ratio, it's a different compound. So H2O means two hydrogens for every one oxygen. You can have H2O2. That's not water. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Gives away the punchline a little bit, but there's a there's an old chemistry joke. Two chemists walk into a bar. The first chemist says, I'll have H2O. The second chemist says, I'll have H2O too. And then he got, drinks it and dies because he got served hydrogen peroxide. Presumably the bartender also knows his chemistry, um, which I've met a few of those in my day, but that's, that's probably the biggest leap in there somewhere. Um, if you have a mixture of two different elements, but not in the same exact ratio, it's not a compound. It's a mixture. And it's not a pure substance. So I guess I should have specified here on our flow chart. Matter is either a pure substance or it's a mixture. And out of our pure substances, you can have elements or you can have compounds. If it's not a pure substance, it's a mixture. The difference between a mixture and a compound is that exact ratio. If it's a mixture, you can have an approximate ratio. Anybody who's ever done any baking um, or even just cooked pasta water, if you add salt to the pasta water before you're cooking pasta, how much salt do you add? A lot, but you don't need a measuring cup for it, right? It's like grab a handful of salt and you throw it in some water. That's not an exact ratio, right? That makes it a mixture. So mixtures... By definition, you can adjust the ratio kind of however you want. It's not an integer number, though. With the compounds, it has to be that same perfect integer ratio of elements, or it's not the same compounds. All right, so a mixture. Here's some other properties of mixtures. Mixtures are physically mixed. The elements are not chemically combined. And we'll define what a chemical bond is um, in, in a little bit when we start talking about quantum. Um, but basically, the individual atoms or the individual molecules are still the same identity. They're just physically mixed together. So if you mix, if go back to our pasta water example. What, if I throw salt in water, what do I have? Salt water. I remove the, the water, what's left behind? Salt. Salt. 
nothing really changed, right? I had to evaporate the water to get it to go away, but I still have the same components. I still have water, I still have salts. That's one of the, the hallmarks of a mixture is that they're usually relatively easy to separate back out. Um, that's not always the case. For example, you can have a mixture of copper and zinc, and that actually is what brass is. Brass is a mixture of copper and zinc. And it's not a different chemical compound because you can change the ratio of zinc to copper to get slightly different properties. Bronze is also copper and zinc and one or two other things, but the ratio of changing the ratio of copper and zinc creates different either bronze or brass. The biggest difference is that ratio, right? Um, that doesn't mean it's really easy to separate the zinc and the copper out from each other. Once you make brass, it's it's doable, but it's more involved than say separating salt from water. Um, this little cartoon down here is another good example of a mixture. It's our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is a mixture of a bunch of different chemicals. So if everything all matter fits into this category. Everything is either an element or a compound or a mixture of elements and compounds. Everything is chemistry, right? Anybody seen ads for things that say that they're chemical free? Those are really always really interesting to me. I have to, you know, I have to resist the urge to demand to speak with a manager and tell them how wrong they are every time I see something like that. Because everything is a chemical, right? You can't have chemical free rock candy or chemical free anything because everything is a chemical, right? Um, everything is either a mixture or a pure substance and every pure substance is either an element or a compound. There's one further classification um, for mixtures. Mixtures can be homogenous. or heterogeneous. Anybody know what those mean? Unevenly mixed. Homogenous means evenly mixed. Again, I gotta stop asking these questions when I have the answer on the slides. That kind of takes away from the piece of point, right? Um, and that gets a little bit trickier to define. Element versus compound versus mixture, that's all really, really clear cut, no exceptions. Homogeneous versus heterogeneous, that's a little bit tougher because how uniformly mixed does it have to be? Is our atmosphere uniformly mixed? Not really. It's close to the same composition if you're just looking at, say, sea level to here. So we have less water in our atmosphere up here, right? We have less of the atmosphere in general, but even so, we have the same proportion of oxygen and nitrogen, but we have less water up here compared to something at sea level. If you go into the upper atmosphere, then you get more of other compounds like ozone. Uh, other nitrogen, oxygen-based compounds tend to occur more in the upper atmosphere. So even our atmosphere seems pretty well mixed. Like you take a breath of air here versus you know, drive over to state line, it's roughly the same air, but local pollutants, altitude, humidity, how high you are into the upper atmosphere all go into changing small amounts. What's a, what's a mixture that you might think is homogenous? Can you think of anything? Salt water? In our pan, if we do a good job mixing it, but what if I throw in too, too big a handful? then it's, it's still salt and water, right? But it's if it's not all the way dissolved, then we got chunks of salt at the bottom still. So even that's not necessarily the same. Coffee? Coffee is okay. Coffee is a decent example. In fact, in fact, I think one of my examples right there is tea with honey in it. Except that, has anybody ever made tea with honey in it? Is it actually homogenous? What happens? The honey all sinks to the bottom, right? 
And for my coffee drinkers, the same is true. The bottom of the, of the pot of coffee is not the same as the top of the pot of coffee. All the chunks that make it through the filter or any little bit of silt and things like that is all at the bottom of the pot or bottom of the cup. So really it depends on what are, how closely zoomed in we are. Did you have an example? So if we don't add the honey, do we get little pieces sink to the bottom? You usually, yeah. It depends on how good your tea bag is as far as keeping keeping all those particles in there. But really, if we zoom in far enough, there's always some degree of heterogeneity. Um, so again, I want you to be aware of these terms, but and we'll use them kind of broadly. But there is a gray area. So on the midterm, when I ask you, I'll do something like this. I'll give you a bunch of examples and say, is it, is it an element, a compound, heterogeneous mixture, homogeneous mixture? I'm not really going to split hairs here. I'll leave that to you. Most of the examples I'll give you, if it's a mixture, either of these is right as long as you explain yourself. If you say the coffee tastes the same at the beginning at the end, or is it about the same concentration as the, at the top of the cup and the bottom of the cup, therefore it's homogenous. I'll give you full credit for that. If you use the same example and you say it's heterogeneous because there's little bits of silt that settle to the bottom over time, I'll also give that full credit. And so it's more about understanding what these terms mean and understanding like what scale are we looking at? How zoomed in are we? Because everything is heterogeneous if you zoom in far enough. Every mixture, I should say. Um, even brass is lit, and the cup of tea is listed as homogeneous, but it really does depend. Um, brass or metal alloys in general usually seem like they're pretty well mixed, um, but that can all change too. Um, has anybody taken a welding class? No? You guys have, have welding here? Yeah. Oh, welding was a great class. I loved welding. Um, you can't weld on stainless steel. Because it's a mixture and heating it up to the, you can, it's really hard to. You need specialized equipment and extra training. Because if you heat stainless steel up to the temperature where you can weld it, you actually cause the mixture to start to separate out into its components. So it no longer stays stainless steel if you try to weld on it. And I don't even know, I think you might even have to get it all the way, all the way back to liquid and recast it to get rid of that. Um, but you know, even, even professional metal workers will usually punch holes and use chemical bonds rather than try to um, weld on something like stainless steel because it's it's really hard to do properly. All right, this is just our example of different uh, of our flow chart chart here with one additional wrinkle to it. It talks about changing between these. So one of the when I ask about you know for a definition of chemistry, um, usually. Maybe things have changed, but Breaking Bad is not as common or as uh, ubiquitous anymore. Somebody says it's the, it's the study of change of matter, because that's what Walter White says in the season one, episode one of Breaking Bad. He does this thing where he's got the isopropyl alcohol in squirt bottles and he sprays a Bunsen burner with it. It's super dangerous and you shouldn't do that in a classroom full of, of students. Um, it is a really cool demonstration, but super dangerous. Um, Changing is where things really get interesting. If you want to change from a pure substance to a mixture, that's generally what's called a physical change. So adding our salt to our water, everything is still the same identity, still the same substances before and after we, we mix them together. If you want to change from an element to a compound or a compound to an element, that's a chemical change. You actually are changing the identity of the molecules, changing what's attached to what a lot more strongly. And so when we talk about chemicals, and this is another one of those ones where I'm not going to use the terms too much 
because you can write physical changes and treat chem physical changes like chemical changes. It's one of these terms though that shows up on standardized tests. Um, understanding the difference between a physical change versus a chemical change. Maybe it's because of my area of study in grad school. I don't see it as large a difference between these two. I don't usually differentiate a physical change versus a chemical change. Um, however, it's something I want you to be aware of. And so a physical change is usually pretty easy to reverse and you still have the same stuff before and after. Chemical change, you have a vastly different identity. You made a new compound as opposed to just taking existing compounds and putting them next to each other. All right, so there's some examples here. Um, phase change, if you just change the, the shape of something, gold is what's known as malleable, which literally means you can hammer it. Mal mal blah, blah, blah. Malleable comes from the Latin term malice, which literally means hammer. Malleable means you can hammer it and it gets flatter. Um, so you can hammer gold until it becomes gold foil. That's how they make gold foil, most foil. They make it by just taking a chunk of metal and hammering it. Is it still gold? Yeah. So it's still, that's just a physical change. You can take that gold foil and re and just melt it and recast it to get the gold bucket or the gold ingot back. Um, phase changes are physical changes. All that's happening is you're giving the different molecules more energy so that they're not staying stuck to each other. They're moving around on their own. And then here's some, anytime you're doing any cooking, cooking is almost always a chemical change. Um, rusting, burning, anytime you hear words like that, those are gonna be mostly chemical changes. Um, anytime you get a color change, that's almost always a chemical change. And they're usually pretty impossible to reverse without some pretty unique circumstances. Um, so if you make, if you make a flan, you can't turn that back into eggs, right? That's a chemical change. Anytime something is browned, when we're talking about cooking, that's a chemical change. There's a difference between that and just say heating something up, right? If you take if you take frozen French fries out of the freezer and you put them on a cookie sheet and you put them in the oven, you just warm them up. You change them chemically. At least if you're, if you're doing it right, right? If you want them crispy, if you want them brown, that's a chemical change. That's a chemical change called the Maillard reaction, right? They are reactions anytime you brown something. It's when you have protein and a protein and sugar together and you add heat. So that's the same reaction that gives this color here. It's the same reaction that's responsible for um, caramel. Making caramel is a Maillard reaction, right? And you can't undo it. Once you burn something cooking, it's burnt. You can't unburn it just by cooling it back down, right? That's how you know it's a chemical reaction. So here's some examples. Is dissolving sugar in water, is that a chemical change or physical change? Physical. What if you heat the water up to the point where, after you dissolve the sugar in it, to the point where it starts getting brown? That's a chemical change. Is burning a candle chemical or physical? physical? What part, why would you say physical? But do you get it all back? So you said chemical, why? One of you did, right? Amazing. Why did you say chemical? You don't know? Yeah, exactly. It, it doesn't even trick. It produces a gas and the gas is not just melted wax. The wick is gone, right? When it cools back down, the wick is shorter than it was. 
And so, and you're missing some wax. The wax actually burns to make CO2 and water. And then so in doing so, it produces heat, which causes parts of the candle to melt. So burning a candle is really both. There's two things happening. The wick burning, the flame is a chemical change, but the wax melting is a physical change. Toasting a marshmallow, chemical. You get a color change and you can't undo it, right? Although I heard somebody won, there was a Nobel Prize in, in physiology a few years ago for somebody who supposedly figured out how to unboil an egg. Um, but I don't think that they mean that in the sense that then you get an egg back at the other end that you could actually like incubate and produce a chicken from. Um, they basically just figured out how to re-dissolve the proteins that are formed that you get when you boil an egg, when you cook an egg. Um, so there, there is some interesting research happening in undoing chemical changes, um, but for the most part, they're pretty irreversible. But dry ice melting. Has anybody ever played around with dry ice? A little bit? Physical? What do you get when dry ice melts? CO2. Dry ice is solid CO2, solid carbon dioxide. It doesn't really melt because you don't get a liquid forming. It sublimes or sublimates, and you go straight from solid CO2 to a gas CO2. But it's just a phase change. It's just a weird one, which you're not as common with as water, or not as common with, not as familiar with. Uh, about burning propane. Chemical. Can't get the propane back, right? Just like burning candle. Anytime you see burning, that's almost a dead giveaway, it's a chemical change. I can't think of a time when we'd say something is burning that it's not a chemical change. And same with phase change words like melting, like freezing, like evaporating. Those are almost always gonna be physical changes when you can recognize those. There's another key word, rusting, oxidizing. Is that chemical or physical? Chemical. chemical. Can you undo that if an old car is rusted out? Can you undo that? It's just surface rust, but how do you do it? How do you fix it? Yeah, so you're not really sanding it, so, or you're not really fixing it so much as you're just getting rid of it and then sealing it again, right? You can undo the rust by applying enough voltage. You can cause the rust to turn back into oxygen and metal, um, but usually that's more trouble than it's worth you wind up spending more on the setup than you would spend on just buying a new door or whatever it is. Last but not least, another fringe case, cutting a pizza. If you cut a pizza, is that physical or chemical? Why? It's still pizza. It's the same before and after. It tastes the same if you cut it versus if you don't cut it, right? But can you undo it? So that's that's one where technically this is and this is kind of a cool uh, cool I won't call it trivia cool thing to think about by cutting pizza you actually are breaking chemical bonds those those gluten pieces those gluten proteins that hold the dough together you actually are using physical force to chemically break them apart in smaller molecules so that's one of those ones where depending on how zoomed in you are and how you explain it, you could call it physical or you could call it chemical, but most people would call it a physical change. I just like to play devil's advocate. All right, let's talk a little bit more about energy. So we mentioned energy before in terms of, chem in terms of kinetic energy. Yeah, we got 10 minutes. Um, we talked about temperature as a way to measure kinetic energy at the molecular level. And chemical bonds is the, is the primary way that we have um, potential energy at the, at the molecular level. Um, and it's not always chemical bonds. Basically, if you can make something that's not very stable, then that's a way of making something that has potential energy because when it rearranges itself or when it reacts to become more stable in doing so, it's gonna release that energy, usually increase the energy of the surroundings 
So you, you wind up turning that physic, that potential energy into kinetic energy um, by breaking those bonds or by making more stable bonds, right? So here's an example. Um, that's a, it is a carbons. That's octane at the top. You take octane and you let it react with oxygen, you get CO2 and water, which is how com internal combustion engines run, right? We don't actually burn octane for the most part. We burn a mixture of molecules that will have some octane and a bunch of other random stuff in there too. But the point is, is that you start with a bunch of carbon and hydrogen and carbon-carbon bonds that are really high energy, that are relatively unstable. And oxygen is really is relatively unstable on its own. And when you allow those two things to react with each other, you get more stable molecules. And so you release the potential energy in the chemical bonds and you turned it into kinetic energy. What does kinetic energy look like in terms of, of this reaction? What happened to the surroundings if you burn off Hello. Yes. Okay. Is, a, is a car's engine okay. hot or cold? Right Why now. is it hot? Because uh, it's burning. It's and when it's burning, you're releasing that chemp that potential energy and turning it into kinetic energy. And kinetic energy looks like increased temperature. All right. We'll talk about this slide on Friday. Uh, maybe we'll start on. There's. We still have nine minutes left. Who said yes? All right. Well, we can spend nine minutes talking about about uh, random chemistry stuff, or we can spend nine minutes talking about the math that we're going to do in lab this week. Random or math? Yeah. Ooh, that was actually more close to an even mixture than I was expecting. Um, well, the math we'll have to go over in more detail on Wednesday anyway. I'm going to throw it up here for a second. We'll split the difference since I actually got answers on both sides here. This, when we're talking about energy changing hands in terms of temperature, it's almost always going to be the same equation. And I'll talk about what this all means here in a second. But basically, this equation, Q equals MCP delta T, looks really confusing. It's actually not too bad. Q stands for heat. And we're going to have to be careful with the way we use the word heat, because heat in a chemistry class or in a physics class doesn't mean the same thing as heat in everyday usage. Um, heat in chemistry means energy is changing hands. You're moving energy from one thing to another. That's not quite the same way you might use the word heat in everyday uh, language. And plus, then we also have what's called specific heat and heat capacity. And those mean two different things than heat. Heat is Q. Heat is energy that changes hands. M is just mass, usually in grams, but you can you can see it in um, kilograms too in some in physics classes. C sub p. The C means is basically that it's a constant, and the C sub p means at a constant pressure. You don't need to worry about that too much until you take physical chemistry as an upper grad, upper division chemistry student. Um, what this means in this case is it's the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of a substance one degree, usually in Celsius, since we're in a science class, we're not gonna deal with Fahrenheit, um, or Kelvin, because a difference of one degree Kelvin is the same as a difference in one degree Celsius. All right, so specific heat is the CP term. Then last is delta T. What is delta T? Change in temperature. Delta always means change in. 
in sciences. Capital, this is capital delta, just looks like a triangle. So basically this is a way to look at how much the temperature changes and use that to figure out how much energy went into the system or how much energy left the system. Another case to be careful with your capitalization. Uppercase T is temperature. What's lowercase T? Time. So don't mix this up. It's not delta lowercase T. That's change in time. That's how long something takes. Delta uppercase T is change in temperature. All right. I want you to see this and hear these terms. We're going to practice using them on Wednesday uh, in part of your, your lab prep. And we will talk about this slide just because I really like this slide. I think that's a cool graph, but we'll talk about it in more detail. So we'll end there.